I'm Tim Marshall. I'm the Provost of the New School, and I want to welcome you all here uh, this morning for the third symposium on India China Institute's Emerging Scholars uh, Program. Uh, I, this is the third in the series. I gather there's been two that happened last year, but this event is part of the India China Institute's continuing commitment to build a community of scholars who are engaged in research that focuses on new and innovative approaches to understanding India-China interactions, comparisons, and their joint impact on different parts of the world. For nearly a decade, ICI has played a key role in establishing and strengthening a network of emerging young scholars from India and China who wish to share their research and advance collaborative scholarship. The Emerging Scholars Program draws on the New School's tradition of fostering integrated knowledge, sharing across disciplines and amongst international scholars from around the world. Following symposiums held in China and India, as I said, in November of last year, this symposium is the last in this three-part series. The third interdisciplinary symposium for emerging scholars on India-China studies is in collaboration with the Center for Policy, Policy Research, Horizon Research and Consultancy Group, the Mulana Abdul Kalam Azad Institute for of Asian Studies, the Observer Research Foundation, the Yunnan Academy of Social Sciences at the Yunnan University, and the University of Calcutta. And so I'm delighted to, to welcome all these partners here with us. I'd also, also like to extend a special thanks to the Star Foundation for their generous support of the symposium series and for the Indian China Institute overall. And we look forward to learning a good deal from these emerging young scholars, and I'm pleased to welcome them to the new school. And we're also delighted that many of our young scholars and practitioners across the social research and design areas of the university continue to engage with our India-China partners. And we're delighted to welcome you here this morning and hope you have a fantastic symposium. And Ashok Gurung is going to come up and actually more formally open proceedings. Ashok, thank you. Thank you, Tim, uh, for both for your opening remarks and also for your continued support, leadership, of course, to the entire university and uh, engagement with India-China Institute. Well, uh, my name is Ashok Gurung. I'm the director of India-China Institute. And it's my great honor and privilege to welcome all of you to this very, very special conversation, uh, a day-long conversation, which actually began almost a year ago. So I'll talk to you about, uh, I'll explain a bit about it in a few seconds. I want to especially thank all our friends who traveled from India and China today. I know it's a long journey. I hope you know uh, there will be plenty of coffee and tea for you to stay awake. Uh, and uh, hopefully, this will be a fruitful trip for you all. Uh, I, I want to do a couple of things. I want to. I have to extend some thank yous although I'm sure I will not be able to thank everyone who has really made this particular initiative possible, but uh, I want to thank some of them. Then I want to tell you a bit about how this particular initiative fits within the larger uh, work of India-China Institute, a little bit about the format of today's uh, deliberations, uh, and then few logistics. So that's what I want to do before I hand over the uh, proceeding to our Chair uh, Nimi Kurian, who will be uh, chairing the first session. So in terms of thank yous, I really want to thank my amazing team at ICI, uh, especially Grace Ho. Where is Grace? Grace is the ICI office manager. She runs the place. She makes me run, and I'm happy to run. Uh, and uh, Yi Ching uh, is the person in charge of you know, Emerging Scholars Initiative. Christina is somewhere here. Christina, Chris, oh, Christina is here. Chris uh, Cruz, uh, and uh, we have Shalini Kisan somewhere at the back. Krishna is at the back. So anyway, number of them you know, uh, 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 who have really worked you know, collaboratively to make this uh, all come together. So thank you all, guys. Now let me also thank Two, uh, my, two of my primary collaborators, I call them partner in crime, Nimi Kurian, Nimi is right there, and uh, Jia Jianning. Jia Jianning, unfortunately, is uh, uh, unable to attend. Uh, unfortunately, her uh, husband, uh, Professor Ben Lee, uh, who uh, 
is one of the uh, co-founders of India China Institute. Uh, he had a bit of a, a medical emergency, but he's recovering. Uh, but Jenning also sends greetings uh, to all of you. Special thanks to Professor Tansen Sen. Where is Tansen Sen? Tansen Sen and Professor Liu Jian, uh, two people that I usually go to when uh, I need to uh, have a deeper understanding of what's happening with India China studies. And they have been really collaborators from the very beginning uh, on this particular initiative. Thanks also to my two colleagues, ICI co academic directors, Mark Frazier and Professor Sanjay Reddy. He's right up there. Both of them, uh, both you know, for their engagement, their advice, and their support. Special thanks to Professor Hari Vasudevan of Calcutta University. Hari, Hari is right there. He was the uh, main host for uh, the uh, symposium, national symposium uh, in Kolkata uh, last November. And uh, Professor Jabole, who, who is not here, uh, he is from Yunnan University, uh, who uh, played uh, a, a central role in hosting the uh, symposium in China. Um, and as Tim uh, mentioned, I want to thank Molana Abul Kalam, Ajad Institute of Asian Studies in Kolkata, Center for Policy Research, Yunnan University, Yunnan Academy of Social Sciences, Observer Research Foundation, Horizon Research, uh, including, you know, Institute of Chinese Studies, Delhi University, and many, many others who uh, really were part of this year-long journey. Now I want to tell you a bit about why focus on emerging scholars and how it fits within the larger ICI work. As many of you know, ICI was partly, you know, established partly in response to addressing the gaps and our uh, intent of going beyond the limits of what we all refer to is the area studies approach of learning about different parts of the world. Especially this, this you know, as many of you know, is a serious issue when you put India-China together. They are often, especially in major you know, universities in America, as well as many parts of the world, India-China are studied separately. So, so, so I think uh, that's one you know, important thing to mention. And as Tim mentioned, uh, we basically, when we began, we had three large intellectual frames. One is really, what can we learn by looking at India-China you know, uh, through its interactions, both historically and you know, in a contemporary context? Second is, what can we learn by really comparing these two countries, uh, even though two countries have a very distinct and very different governing systems and ideologies? You know, whether it's an issue of you know, poverty elevation or urban development, I think there's much one can learn by comparing these two countries. And we will hear some of that today from young scholars. The last intellectual frame that we have is really the uh, you know, reemergence of India-China, its joint impact on the rest of the world. You, know, you can look at you know, its neighbors, you can look at Africa, you can look at US. And I think there's much one can you know, gain by you know, looking through these uh, frames. During the first eight years of ICI, we invested significant amount of our resources and energies in building a vibrant community of scholars and institutions who really now in some ways forms the basis of a lot of interesting conversations. We organized many of our conversations around thematic lines. For instance, we had uh, four thematic you know, uh, areas, urbanization and globalization, prosperity and inequality, social innovation for sustainable environments, everyday religion and sustainable environments in the Himalayas. So around these uh, topics, we uh, were lucky to have now almost you know, over you know, 70 or 80 scholars working in different parts of the uh, you know, world uh, on these topics. And now I'm happy to tell you with Mark Frazier and Sanjay Reddy as two co-academic directors at ICI, we are developing one very interesting uh, intellectual frame, which I think would serve us well to both you know, build on what we have done so far, but also to uh, explore new avenues under the theme of economies and societies. Many of you have you know, really already made uh, important contribution in advancing that particular you know, thematic uh, area. While we focus a lot on looking at these topics uh, from uh, power centers, such as Delhi or Beijing, we are also very mindful of the importance of looking at the margins. And this is something that fits very nicely with new schools, intellectual tradition of thinking outside the box, 
asking critical questions. So for us, when we think about margins, we're really talking about both in a margins in terms of geography, but also in terms of content. Geography, we are looking at southwest part of China, Himalayas, northeast part of India. In terms of you know, a content, uh, for example, this Emerging Scholars Initiative, I would consider is also on the margins. We know that, uh, you know, especially in India, China, when you think about young scholars, they really are on the margins because they have very limited resources to access you know, to. Uh, they get very limited uh, intellectual uh, support uh, advising uh, because you know there are very few uh, so-called area studies type places where they can actually pursue deeper studies and if you happen to be someone uh, interested in India China story and you are studying uh, in a law school or business school or economics department then the story becomes even more complicated so 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 the focus on emerging scholars really is a way for us to delve into uh, you know this idea that uh, if we are thinking about really developing long-term engagements and uh, contributing uh, in generating uh, new knowledge and also make knowledge relevant, then you need to focus on young scholars. And here I want to really thank many, many uh, established scholars, well-known scholars. Uh, many of them are not in this room, uh, have uh, really, uh, they uh, saw the opportunity, they saw the problem, and they have been uh, big uh, you know, supporters of this initiative, and I'm thankful to all of them. Now let me tell you a bit about the format of uh, this uh, conversation, how it evolved. Mm. So as in the past, today's uh, symposium, India-China Conversation, really is a culmination of over a year-long journey. Uh, basically uh, centered around two-step process. The first step uh, was really uh, inviting. Uh, we basically sent out call for papers to anyone who is working on India or China, uh, in India, China, and for India, China, both in the US, to really uh, tell us whether they are interested in sharing their work. And we received over uh, 90 uh, applications, mostly from India. Uh, in China, we got very few applications, and part of it has to do with English language, and we can talk about it later this afternoon. But out of that uh, uh, group of uh, applications, we invited 10 uh, uh, scholars uh, to uh, you know, uh, share their work uh, in each location, uh, one in Calcutta and one in Kunming. Um, when we say emerging scholars, we basically mean uh, anyone who is uh, pursuing their advanced uh, doctoral work or even professional degree or anyone who has completed their PhD within past five years. And the idea is to really focus on people who are still in their early stages of scholarship. And out of those two national symposiums, we then selected two people from each location and then we invited three people from the US and total, uh, we ha we, today we will have, or uh, we will hear from seven uh, young scholars. And uh, basically the format is that each of these uh, scholars will take uh, 15 minutes to share their work. Their papers have already been shared with um, uh, uh, senior scholars. Uh, and we have asked our colleagues to take five minutes to comment on their paper. Mm. And um, the idea is, both to give them support, look at their work uh, in a critical manner, uh, and uh, hopefully with whatever feedback each of our discussions uh, will give, combined with comments from the uh, audience, will allow our young scholars to go back and revise their paper, which we hope we will publish uh, in our uh, ICI working paper series. And now we have almost 12 to 15 very good papers from the past three years, uh, and we're hoping to in, uh, eventually uh, put together an edited volume where we can really uh, bring interdisciplinary voices uh, uh, or uh, showcase young scholars' perspective on India-China story. So today's format, basically we have two sessions. The first session will uh, begin soon after I uh, stop talking here. Uh, and then uh, there will be lunch. Everyone is invited to uh, join us for uh, the lunch. And after lunch, the second session will, uh, you know, uh, will uh, end around uh, 4 o'clock. 
And at that point, we will walk towards the uh, uh, Teresa Lang uh, Hall, which is on the 13th Street. So, so let's walk together. And the final session, really a session that uh, is designed to have more as a roundtable discussion, a conversation around re-envisioning re India-China studies. Uh, and and we, we, I think we, we have three very good uh, people who will get the conversation started. But I know in the room we have many, many who have uh, thought about these issues uh, for uh, quite some time. So we should have a very interesting conversation uh, in the afternoon as well. And after that, we'll have a brief reception. Uh, and I hope everyone can stay for that so that you can have chance to uh, give, uh, you know, both, you know, whatever you know, feedback you want to give to our, uh, our friends uh, who have traveled from India, China, and, you know, uh, Connecticut and Boston. Uh, let's see what else I have to say here. A couple of notes on the logistics. This event uh, is recorded. And by being here, uh, you are basically agreeing to be recorded. And we will uh, post uh, this uh, you know, recording uh, on our website. So anyone wants to go back and look at any comments, you know, you're welcome to do so. On the, uh, another thing that I wanted to mention is all our guests, especially those who are traveling from outside, you know, I think some of you have to take care of some paperwork. Uh, please find Shalini sometime during the day, either over lunch or during break so that you know uh, you can uh, you know uh, take care of some of the uh, you know necessary paperwork that needs to be done before we can process any uh, you know requests or take care of your uh, you know on ramps and stuff like that okay on that note i wish uh, our scholars the very best to share their work and and uh, thank you again for uh, coming to this uh, you know uh, session uh, today thank you Thank you, Ashok. Please. Um, on behalf of um, everyone here uh, at uh, ICI, uh, let me welcome all of you to the first session on uh, fragmented geographies, diaspora, and FDI. Um, and as you can see from the schedule, we have a real packed uh, session. We have about 12 uh, speakers today, four uh, main presenters, um, the young scholars, and about eight uh, discussants. The idea being uh, to give as much feedback, um, constructive critical feedback uh, to the young scholars um, as possible. Uh, so, so let's get started. When on the, uh, you know, we have an interesting bunch of uh, papers today, and one possible way to uh, look at some of these questions just is to see, and this broadly reflects or resonates with some of the themes that. Um, you s get to see when you r go through these papers in the, in session one is to see is, is to possibly see them uh, as flows and networks flows and networks that uh, really operate <coughs> above and below uh, national uh, the national level and how human geographies have uh, always the interesting, and this is what fascinates me, how human geographies do not operate in a sort of terra nullius, as it were, but really build on complex histories of transnational social and cultural exchanges. So, um, and, and um, also in the process how transnational social ethnic capital really goes on to reconstitute and reconfigure uh, social and symbolic practices. Uh, so without much further ado, let me um, um, uh, call upon the first uh, speaker, uh, presenter. Um, so I'll, since the detailed bios are with all of you, I'll just stick to single line entries and I'll just invite uh, uh, the first speaker in the, in the interest of time. So let me invite uh, Dr. Uttam Lal, Assistant Professor, Geography and Natural Resources Management, Sikkim University, India, to make his presentation. Well, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, India China Institute. Well, uh, as Asok was just now, he was speaking that you know, uh, uh, India China Institute, and 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 the idea is also you know here is to uh, consider the margin. So I would not be rather you know uh, speaking from the perspective of what New Delhi thinks or what you know Beijing thinks. Rather, I would be talking more from the perspective of margins. Well, uh, this is the area that uh, I would I would be speaking. 
basically uh, my study is on two provinces of india which is uh, called himachal pradesh and sikkim himachal lies in the western himalaya and sikkim lies in the eastern himalaya and incidentally sikkim is also you know uh, the smallest province in india population wise well uh, <coughs> in sikkim or in himachal it's not the entire you know state that uh, uh, i'm i'm sorry uh, sometime i would be using the word state state i mean in india we call provinces as a state so uh, it's not the entire state of sikkim or himachal that i would be talking about because the here what i am talking about is the interactions with the highlanders of himachal and sikkim which they had across the himalaya or or into trans himalaya and in 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 tibetan plateau well so in in sikkim i'll be talking about solamu area and and gyam sona area gurudangmar Lasser Valley and Mugudhang area of Lonak Valley. So this entire area of Sikkim it lies in Trans Himalaya, or rather, you know, uh, uh, you can say uh, it is extension of Tibetan Plateau. Whereas a, a small stripe of Sikkim called Zulub, Nathang, and Kupup it lies uh, in the Great Himalayan range. Well, uh, Himachal, primarily, I am talking about two districts of Himachal called Kinaur and Lahol Spiti. because these two district always had a space relation with tibet and uh, to some extent you know even beyond tibet uh, uh, in china and what i'm trying to <coughs> speak is from the you know uh, perspective or or the interaction which i had with the traders uh, the seafort and the uh, you know pilgrims particularly in my study uh, i tried and speak to nuns uh, as you can see from the table that uh, in himachal i tried to you know uh, have interaction with uh, uh, 31 people but uh, uh, out of this 31 uh, uh, except for three rest were all nuns and the three were uh, the uh, uh, monks well why i uh, prefer nuns because of the obvious reason that you know nuns are usually not that mobile as the monks they have been and and in the similar uh, a uh, fashion i try to speak to primarily nuns in 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 sikkim as uh, you can see number 3 in 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 the stable and among the uh, seafort and traders i speak to try to speak to only those people who have ever been to tibet uh, recently or maybe you know prior to uh, the 1962 event and uh, that time around when the border got closed well uh, methodology i i uh, with the seafords i uh, had the walk and talk kind of interview uh with the you know border villages i had a focus group discussion and i had a simple uh, random sampling and snowball uh, snowball sampling to identify uh, people who have ever been to tibet or they are you know the traders who have been trying to go across uh, uh, to the uh, across the border well uh, <coughs> quite often what we uh, hear about is you know the silk route and we try and and paint the entire picture with the same stroke well silk route throughout the you know stretch of himalaya whether we are talking about western himalaya whether we are talking about eastern himalaya it was a umbrella term it was a you know com uh, uh, a composite term which used to you know uh, take into its its fold route which was primarily for wool exchange then there used to be route which was primarily for grain exchange then there used to be routes which used to, uh, which was for borax and the salt and so on and so forth so what i'm trying to uh, talk here is there was not one particular route that you know uh, i try to talk about or i try to you know uh, i'm trying to speak there used to be n number of routes prior to the events which took place around 1962 and many of uh, such routes are either forgotten or they are uh, these these routes are dying because of disuse and disrepair well <coughs> uh and and since i am talking about uh, trans himalaya in particular well uh, i'm not <coughs> trying to see it from the perspective of the silk route romance that uh, most of us, us that we are having in the in the you know recent time rather uh i'm trying to or, or i try to understand it as you know trans ecological exchange of course i mean there is some degree of 
uh, uh, synergy between these two words, the trans ecological exchange and the Silk Road. I'm also trying to you know, uh, divide these trans ecological exchanges throughout you know, uh, length and breadth of Himalaya into three uh, main, or, or rather three sub uh, uh, categories, which is Western route, which covers you know, uh, Kashmir, Leh, Lahasa, and, and the central route, which was you know, uh, touching uh, Lahasa, or, or which was uh, connecting Lahasa to Patna through uh, Kathmandu. And then I'm talking about uh, uh, Eastern route, which was around Sikkim area, the Kalimpong, and, and it used to point across through Chumbi Valley to Lhasa. Well, further this, this fracture, uh, this fragmentation of the route, it was, you know, a kind of divide, uh, it was sutured through the pil numerous pilgrim trails, uh, the medical missions with the missionaries they had around some of the uh, colonial towns in, in, in uh, Indian Himalaya, and then the southward flow of knowledge seekers, which in time, it, the, the flow of the knowledge seekers, it reversed. Because initially, people used to come to India uh, for, for uh, religious knowledge. And then in course of time, people from the so-called periphery of India, they started going to Tibet uh, for religious and, and for you know, uh, medical knowledge as well, and, and get themselves trained in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in, in Tibetan medicine. Well, uh, I try to you know comprehend how the people, at the border area at the, the you know margins they perceive uh, this area because you know borderland is not about borders merely because uh, uh, borderlands are also the homeland. Well, uh, when I try to speak to the traders, by the way, traders here in in uh, Himachal and in uh, Sikkim, in in both the provinces they are the local people they are the minor uh, they are the petty traders they are not like you know traders uh, uh, who have a lot of money they are like regular normal village people who uh, get some bit of time to uh, supplement their livelihood with the trade well so uh, there are very few people who are actually going across the border for trading i try to speak what is the reason even though you know 19 uh, uh, 1991 onwards, both the governments have been working for greater, you know, trade uh, interaction. But uh, till now, the trade interaction it, it remains more of archaic nature because people, uh, because the list which are handed down to people from government, it talks about you know uh, the archaic trade items like yak tails, butter, who trades in in, in these these days with so much of uh, uh, industrial substitute. Well, so the challenges which uh, the border communities or, or the traders, they talked about incidentally, you know, if I try and see from the mainland perspective, particularly in India, uh, we, you know, kind of uh, end up talking that, you know, uh, across the border, we find a lot of restrictions and sometimes, you know, we find the unfriendly behavior or, or things are too intimidating. But incidentally, uh, my interaction with the traders, it talks about that you know the Indian official attitude, it's more intimidating than across when uh, whenever they across to China. Well, uh, and then I said, do you uh, not find you know officials in China intimidating? They said, yes, they are officials, but they are less fussy than our own Indian officers. Well, uh, <coughs> then uh, the other challenges they find is extremely limited trade that I was talking about. That they need to you know trade in. Uh, uh, goat hides, uh, yak tails, which is of no use or, or which is of very limited use today. So going across and taking all the trouble because in, in, in Sikkim you have a road, you can go across and you can you have market both sides of the border. But at the same time in Himachal you don't have a road, you don't have a, 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 a facilities where you go across the border and dump your, you, you sell off your goods. So you have to go to literally Across the border, you have to go to the village and find people to buy your uh, goods. Well, uh, <coughs> so this is uh, these are some of the reasons why people are not so much excited as we would, you know, in, uh, ideally like it to be. That I mean, if the border is allowed to, uh, for the people to move across, and people they really want to, you know, move across. But why is that? That the, the you know uh, economic aspect of the interaction is not taking off. 
in, in the border area. Well, the lack of infrastructure is, is uh, there particularly. It, it's, uh, you know, more so in, in Himachal because, you know, uh, this side of the border or rather, you know, the other side of the border, you don't have a place where they can, you know, meet people, they can meet buyers. You don't have, you know, banks, you don't have a, a, a marketplace. In the name of, you know, marketplace, particularly in, in Himachal sector, you have a fenced area, which is called Indra Market, but you just have barbed wire in, 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 in the name of Indra Market. But at the same time, traders from Indian side, they do go across, but so far none of the traders from Tibetan side, they have come this side of the border. I try to speak, you know, why this is so. Well, the best answer which I could comprehend, which I could get, is again, I mean, uh, the intimidating officials. And at the same time, you don't have a place for the people who are coming this side of the border to sell off their goods. Because in the Indian side, villages are located little far off. And be it Sikkim or be it Himachal, once, like Sikkim also, they are allowed to you know, come this side. But uh, fortunately, in Sikkim, uh, goods uh, laden lorry, they come, they cross the border. And there is uh, a, a marketplace where they come, they can, they can you know, buy things, they can sell off things, and they can go back. And the entire thing has to be done in a window period of a couple of hours in a day. So this means around you know, 11 o'clock, border would open. You will sell off your things, and you have to go back the same day. So uh, <coughs> for Sikkim, fortunately, this is still OK. It, it, it's kind of you know working. But Himachal sector, it's not working because there's no marketplace where they can meet the prospective buyers. Well, Seford's view, uh, I try to speak to you know uh, uh, this many uh, Seford. And most of the Seford, they are for the you know uh, uh, for a, for a border which is softer, what I mean, they are for the border which allows them to move across. Because for centuries, these efforts they have been you know exchanging gene pools. Apart from you know exchanging the cultural you know uh, uh, exchanges that what they used to have, if the exchange of the gene pool was also there. Particularly in in, in case of you know Sikkim, yaks are reported to be you know having some sort of genetical defect because of generations of inbreeding. Well, uh, these are, you know, uh, there are a lot of a similar kind of a story from Sikkim and, and from uh, Himachal both. Well, uh, only, you know, uh, four in, in case of Himachal and, and in case of Sikkim, only one said, I don't need a softer border. Well, the, I tried and uh, probe further. These people, they don't need, uh, you know, a softer border because they are little you know, scared that in Tibet there is better gene pool of the domestic animals. And once, you know, there are exchanges, their business would run down. Then I try to run the rationale. What about the exchanges? Your uh, uh, gene pool would also uh, improve. And then they had you know, no particular kind of, you know, answer. Well, uh, <coughs> I tried and see these border areas from the perspective of, you know, suturing uh, geography. Because what I find is, you know, uh, way back in time, this uh, area was, you know, more having more uh, uh, space relation more with the, you know, Tibet or, for that matter, villages in Tibet. They had a space relation uh, this side of the Himalaya more than, you know, further north or, or, or you know, deeper inside. So, uh, <coughs> but after 1962, the border becomes sacrosanct. The moving across the border, having those, you know, economic and the cultural exchanges that become highly, highly filtered. And <coughs> but nonetheless, there were, you know, uh, some channels which was opened up. People used to, you know, still uh, try and move across because they used to be, you know, relatives also in, in some cases. They, or, or rather in most of the cases in, in the border village, uh, border district, you have relative across. And the earning for, uh, uh, you know, seeing your relatives or what my granddad used to talk about the trade in the, in the previous uh, decades, it, it, it is more appealing. So there are, you know, demand for the people to, to move across and having greater, you know, uh, interactions. So what I see is, you know, prospect in the, in the change time 
of suturing this border geography is from you know the trans uh, asian energy corridor that we have been you know talking for quite some time and the trans buddhist circuit because in reality the trans buddhist circuit there used to be you know uh, integration of eastern and the western himalaya it used to be through uh, uh, tibet people used to uh, get into uh, uh, tibet in the rather you know from western himalaya from uh, himachal from ladakh from uttarakhand they used to get to uh, Kalas Mansrover, and then they used to move to uh, Lahasa and Sigatse, and then they would further get down in, 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 in Kalimpong area, in Darjeeling, and further down, they would take the train, and they would go to uh, Bodh Gaya, Sarnath, and then again, they would reach to their destination. So it was a complete full circle that we used to talk about uh, prior to 1962. Well, uh, in the modern times, now we are talking about uh, integration of this Buddhist circuit in the first stage, we have already, you know, uh, Nepal, India, and uh, Japan on board. But uh, even the government documents, it talks about taking Thailand and China on board. Uh, but so far, no work has been done on, on, on this account. Well, uh, if I skip this, uh, you know, slide, as the time is running out, these are some of the institutions which I could think of having in, in uh, say, our border provinces, which would you know, not only serve the local community, rather, you know, from the perspective of uh, having greater interactions across the border, uh, and, and we can learn a lot from, you know, having this uh, interaction, or we can share a lot of uh, resources. Say, for that matter, uh, the rangeland study. China and, and uh, other Central Asian republics, they have done a great deal of work on rangeland studies, but to best of my knowledge, in India, we have hardly done anything regarding that. So we ne uh, need to learn a lot from the range language studies, and we can have a center of, for, say, range language study in some of the, uh, <coughs> say, uh, 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 prov uh, provinces in, in the border area. Well, uh, since the time is running out, uh, I would rather you know, skip this, and thank you. Thank you, Uttam. <clears throat> May I now invite uh, the two discussants, uh, um, Professor Liujia. Sorry? Oh, oh, you, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you want all the presenters? Yeah, okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay, let me invite uh, the second uh, paper presenter, um, Sue Ying. Um, she's a PhD candidate at the Institute of International Studies at Yunnan University, and she is going to be speaking on Indians' attitudes towards English. Okay, good morning. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the Indian China Institute for inviting me to be uh, to participate in this symposium. I thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with you some of my thoughts and uh, principally to learn quite a lot by being here. And uh, the topic I will discuss is Indian's attitude towards English. An attitude in the paper to a large extent is not based on uh, uh, individual level but on national level. It may go beyond the personal subjective level. That is to say the paper is not concerned with an individual's personal views about the language but with a salient tide of attitude in corresponding period of time. And the attitude is subject to change and is evolving in an ongoing process, which has been and is being shaped by a variety of discourses, institutions, and uh, perceptions. And the paper uh, makes an attempt to clarify the clues of Indians and Chinese attitude to English respectively, comment on their respective attitudes to the language and its culture, explain and analyze why there are transformations, transformations and ambivalences in their attitude to the language in both countries. Um, by comparison, we, we find that the history of China's English education is shorter. English has been more profoundly involved in social, historical, cultural, and political context of India, and it has uh, deeper roots in India. 
And uh, one's attitude to a certain language is always relevant to the status of this language and its speakers as a whole. As for India, its attitude to English has uh, fluctuated widely. Uh, for example, re regarding it as an elite language, as a window on the world, as a language of enlightenment, a language of colonialism, an indispensable language of internal and uh, international communication, a language for business, to name just a few. This was a reflection of the interaction between India and Britain, later between India and the world represented by English. Before independence, especially during the British Raj, the status of English was further strengthened or enhanced in British colonial discourse, particularly in its policy and the corresponding institutions con concerning language and education, which had a direct impact on India's attitude to English. And, uh, English as a language of British colonies possesses multiple symbolic meanings. Uh, it was not only the symbol of their brutal behavior, their extraction of wealth and uh, exploitation which invoked sadness and hatred among Indians. It was but also a token of representative of Western civilization, science, and technical progress which resulted in multiple attitudes to it. Both aspects of the symbolic meaning of the language were discerned by the visionary, visionary Indians. That's why there had been widespread demand for access to English among local knowledgeable Indians because they believed that English language and uh, Western education would help Indians to adopt modern, rational, democratic, liberal, and patriotic outlook. And uh, new, new fields of knowledge in science, humanities, and uh, literature would unfold before them. This is the origins of positive attitude to English, uh, and all this, uh, had a positive political, social, and cultural impact on Indian society. And after independence, Indian's attitude to English was ambivalent, mainly because of the conflict between uh, emotional problems and practical concerns. Emotionally, when the state throws off their canolia shackles, they also attempt to uh, shake off the vestiges of uh, colonialism, including the alien na language. An independent country could not be truly free until its uh, people gave up the use of a foreign langu language and adopted its own, at least within the borders of its own state. But in practice, English became a useful weapon of non-Hindi speaking groups to circumvent the power of Hindi-speaking groups. And uh, only English could serve as a very important link <coughs> language among the educated and uh, as a ling lingua franca for the country. English should be returned, more importantly, because Indian could not immediately detach itself from Britain politically, economically, and culturally. A more dominant role for English was rising dramatically with uh, uh, globalization. Anyone that will be engaged in software industry, outsourcing, medicine, and engineering should possess the concomitant knowledge of English. When it comes to Chinese attitude to English, it is its uh, special historical experiences political ties or climate and the cultural concern that really count. There, um, if we would like to have a general understanding of Chinese attitude to English, the clue may be found in three dimensions, historical, political, and cultural. There is also ambivalence in Chinese attitude to English. On the one hand, 
Okay, on the one hand, on the one hand, Chinese or Chinese government during most historical periods has attached great importance to the instrumental value of the English learning uh, or the utilitarian knowledge of English. Learning foreign language to a large extent is for various purposes, diplomatic, military, intellectual, educational, economic, and so on. While on the other hand, Chinese government was always concerned about the cultural impact of uh, English learning and attempted to preserve cultural identity and integrity by keeping out the foreign essential cultural values to the greatest greatest extent possible. That's because the time when China began the learning of foreign language coincided with the Chinese early modern history when China uh, at that time represented by the government of the late Qing dynasty uh, felt threatened by growing crisis of loss of both the homeland and cultural integrity due to the opium war, due to the opium wars, immediately followed by the military, political, and economic domination by foreign powers. The top priority at that moment was to save the nation, including its land and culture, from subjugation and ensure its survival. And this urgent task outweighed uh, enlightenment and other concerns. And for the conclusion part of my paper, that uh, one's attitude to certain foreign language to some degree is its attitude to the culture that the language signifies. Different attitudes held by India and China to the English language have direct uh, impact on their experience in their communication and intercourse with the out, outside world today. And uh, it seems that all those experiences uh, concerning English have facilitated Indians' integration into the globalization and the world economy. And uh, this imperialist linguistic legacy has well served its national development and international cooperation. Uh, and uh, it is easier for India to be recognized by the mainstream Western society. While for China, a historically a semi-colonial country with English education and culture not so deep-rootedly established, as in India, it's much more difficult. And, uh, and the attitudes um, of both countries, which have been constructed by their specific uh, historic histories, cultures, and uh, their interactions with the outside world are still evolving. The attitude is stable within a particular historical period, but it is also variable in the long run. Okay. And uh, the paper will lay a foundation for further research. Interdisciplinary studies can be drawn on for inspiration and analytical framework. Okay, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Su Suying. Uh, may I now invite uh, um, Min Ye, um, Assistant Professor, Department of International Relations at the Boston University. She's, the title of her presentation is Diffusion by Diasporas, FDI in China and India. Well, good morning. Um, uh, so uh, my uh, topic today is Diaspora and Diffusion of Capitalism. I use foreign direct investment policy liberalization as a case. 
um, there's a big case and there will be minor cases in the article. Um, it's very long, so, uh, but I will be very disciplined and finish the presentation in 15 minutes. Uh, before I start, I really want to thank the, uh, uh, the, this institute and uh, Mark Frazier for uh, letting me know this great opportunity to present my work. Um, China-Indian comparison, I have pursued for more than 10 years. <laughs> so, uh, um, and um, hopefully this would uh, be a transition project and uh, lead into next uh, book project. Uh, so I really appreciate the multidisciplinary emphasis that this institute is bringing. And I thought my model is multidisciplinary, but actually it's much narrower. I realize I'm really political science by training. Um, so I uh, composed this uh, uh, the kind of framework, explanatory framework. I call it a diaspora and diffusion of new policy. Uh, and uh, it really builds on existing literature in political science. And uh, but political science has dip disciplines of IPE and international political economy and comparative politics. I added to these two uh, big uh, disciplines, uh, I uh, draw some insights from diffusion studies in so sociology. So uh, this graph uh, shows a traditional explanation in the uh, in political science and uh, political economy uh, the, uh, on uh, pol new policy adoption. Uh, so normally, most uh, existing works focus on uh, either domestic groups, interest groups, how they bring out different kinds of policies, or policy makers, and where do they get the ideas, uh, and, and uh, how they were pushed by different interest groups. And the third uh, aspect will be the implementation, and uh, the process. You know, how the policy, the initial policy got tested in reality, then reinforced the, uh, the, the process of liberalization. Um, so that, that's the triangle um, in the uh, uh, solid line, collect, connected by solid lines. And um, to adding to this existing explanations, I uh, focus on diasporas. You know, diasporas as external actors uh, yet share a co uh, ethnic link linguistic ties with home, homeland actors. So what diaspora, uh, diasporas do uh, to provide, potentially provide positive ideas to both domestic groups and the policy makers. And also they might, they, they, if they have, they'll provide resources you know, to help implementation, which the results of policy implementation feeds back to a, a policy, a new policy adoption. So that's uh, uh, the idea. And uh, uh, actually, going back, so in this chart, uh, it shows two messages that will influence the um, uh, the effectiveness of diaspora um, impacts. The first one is if diasporas can have multiple channels to domestic groups, like both interest groups and rulers, clearly the ideational transfer would be multiplied and more effective. And second one is if they provide both ideas and resources, so they influence the policy ideas, but also help uh, implementation. So if the if diaspora can have these features, they tend to be very strong influencers of new policy uh, uh, adoption in their home countries. So in the article, I have multiple cases on China. Uh, here, I only focus on one. But overall, by tracing the beginning of China's open door policy, uh, in China, the diasporas have these features. First, they are multi-level. So they have, uh, at the top level, there were very sustained uh, ex uh, interactions and exchange uh, between the top leaders of China, Deng Xiaoping, 
in this period, and uh, then there's a uh, uh, big uh, business representatives in the overseas uh, population. Uh, so I uh, traced uh, Deng Xiaoping, Henry Fork, and uh, Wai Ki uh, Pao, Wai Ki Pao, and also the CPCCC is uh, uh, one of the top political organs in China. Chinese political uh, pe Chinese People's Political Consultatory Conference. It's kind of a little bit convoluting, uh, but uh, it's uh, one of the top uh, uh, organ. And uh, there, these uh, representatives of diaspora are actually rep uh, uh, included in, in this organ. And Deng Xiaoping was a chair uh, for the first uh, four years uh, in doing the reform. At the local level, I only focus on provincial and the big city levels, and these diasporas have very frequent exchange and societal level. So uh, basically, I offer evidence. You know, there there are multiple uh, uh, channels, and uh, they have different inputs. You know, they have both ideas of capitalism, uh, open door ideas, uh, foreign investments, um, and market ideas. But they are also investors. So they bring capital, technology, uh, trade networks. So these are uh, resources, um, and so uh, in the detailed uh, policy cases will include uh, the circle export zones and uh, the special economic zone uh, uh, bill in, in China. So they, the, um, and now move to India. Uh, this is a, a figure uh, that these uh, diasporas or returned Indians from overseas and joined Indian government uh, in the uh, late 1980s, and they stayed on. You know, of course, a couple of them were there before the um, the 1980s, uh, before the mid 1980s. But the um, the the goal of this chart is to show that when India uh, began foreign direct investments or thinking about uh, opening to foreign investors, these were the people that played a very important role in the policy uh, drafting and implementation. And uh, uh, as uh, it shows that these were really influential, uh, but they uh, the backgrounds were more professional, what I call professional diasporas. So they got education from either UK or U the US, and then worked at international uh, organizations. So great policy experience. And then they returned and uh, uh, took on, uh, took uh, these key positions in making new policies in India. So at the policy level, quite influential. Uh, but as you can see, these were diaspora with great ideas ideas, but they couldn't really bring the trade networks or uh, capi detailed capital technology that would facilitate directly the implementation of, of market reform. Uh, so it's, uh, so it's a, uh, and the, the reach beneath the country was relatively um, uh, 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 more, uh, more limited than compared to China. So, um, so it's, then um, and uh, in the investments flows into China, and it shows that the the diaspora investment share was uh, much smaller than the Chinese. I I, I don't provide a comparator chart here, but basically the Chinese uh, diaspora investments constituted the majority, in you know, 50% to 80% investment in China, foreign investment in China came from diasporas. Um, in India, uh, actually I was actually impressed with the earlier uh, uh, share and the earlier four years of opening uh, the diaspora the, uh, investment occupied for about a third, and it was very sizable, but it declined declined uh, in the latter part of the 1990s. And uh, I, I think uh, there are two reasons. One was uh, the uh, non-diaspora, you know, Western inv investments were picking up. But more importantly, at the policy level, the earlier, uh, 91 to 94, the Indian governments offered special incentives to diaspora investments. And in the latter part, they stopped those special treatments. You know. uh, but in, in the, uh, I think the policy change might explain the, to the, the explain the the real decline uh, in the share. 
In one sector in India, um, uh, the software services, the, um, the, the strong diaspora networks that I described in China also applied. Um, and then you guys perhaps are well aware of the software services industries. And uh, my story is to use the diaspora to explain the success. And uh, I, um, f uh, statistics show the software uh, services actually are becoming a major uh, sector and revenue gener generating sector in India um, and bigger uh, uh, export uh, components. Um, so here the multi-level uh, channels also applied. Uh, at the national level, the telecom minister uh, that starting 1984 onward uh, was uh, uh, a diaspora uh, the entrepreneur, uh, returned a diaspora entrepreneur. And the bubble committee, who was in charge of F, uh, uh, telecom, uh, I'll be finishing up like in two minutes, <laughs> um, but thanks. So the Baba committee uh, was also you know, trained overseas. So lots of networks going on at this level. And industry, uh, basically almost every big software services providers in India uh, grow uh, based on international markets, but connected by, uh, by diasporas, like uh, uh, TCS, you know, Tata Consultancy Services. The, um, the New York office was led by MIT graduate, uh, uh, Indian uh, MIT graduate. So at societal level, so the, the connections between Indian prof uh, IT work, uh, labor force, entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, uh, the connection with home was very frequent, and that was shown by surveys uh, uh, after surveys. And also, I give examples of how these small uh, sectors in the services industry were all led uh, uh, by the returned uh, um, uh, diasporas. So basically, uh, in, these, uh, in software services, the diasporas showed the multi-level linkages, so the influences were mu much more uh, extensive and effective, but also they were both ideational providers as well as resources providers, and um, technology, capital, and, and uh, market connection to the United States. So I'll conclude. Um, uh, what about state policy? So diaspora was like an external condition that uh, a country can have, and China and India has, have lots of them. And both are large countries with a long history. So this kind of country just have lots of overseas population and being uh, very focused on education. And so this overseas population tend to have uh, do pretty good in, uh, in a foreign, uh, in more advanced societies. Um, so I, I think the external conditions are really comparable, but domestic politics actually make a big difference in in explaining their divergence uh, uh, the, across countries, but also across sectors. Um, uh, and, uh, and the second point is uh, uh, they both show the state can do a lot despite their different political uh, regimes. But um, if the state is more open uh, to diasporas, they will be more successful. Um, and also, each of the state has domestic groups that, that, that uh, offer competing positions against these investor, investor networks. So if this kind of opposition is weaker, uh, then the diasporas will come more, more easily. Um, so I think for a diaspora program, like if these countries want to leverage on uh, their overseas talents as well as resources, uh, there are the, the, the three aspects. One is to provide incentives for them to return, you know, giving them opportunities. But also, once return, how open the system is really, really will make a bigger difference. And opportunities, you know, what kind of opportunities you give them uh, the, to. The final uh, reflection that I have is I think in China, economic opportunity is, is actually great, but uh, political op opportunity is more limited. And uh, in India, maybe they can work on both opportunities more. OK, well, thank you so much, and welcome your comments. <laughs>
Thank you, Minye. Uh, let me now invite the last uh, presenter in this session, uh, Yu Chang. Um, he is assistant professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Connecticut. And the title of his presentation is Institutions, Labor Mobility, and FDI in China and India. Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the, the Indian China Institutes, and especially Mark and uh, Ashok, for uh, providing this opportunity for me to present this on um, my uh, research on Indian China. So, actually, I was go also going to just talk about the foreign direct investment in Indian China, but I was going to look at it in different perspective as you know my, uh, my colleague uh, I mean yet uh, presented so well we're going to start to look at this you know this chart by looking at you know the the trajectory of the FDI uh, you know growth in China India as you can see while China's you know FDI has been growing um, has a higher level uh, to you know but it's actually the trajectory is quite similar you know they all just picked up the, you know at some point China was actually in the uh, early 1920, uh, 1990s and India was actually about 10 years um, late but they all have kind of like you know in the recent years has been uh, make a quite impressive you know uh, growth so this similarity actually was being contrasted to the the uh, structure of the you know the uh, economic uh, growth model. So this one actually shows the you know the um, uh, the the industry or manufacturing and the services you know in their you know as as a components of their economic growth. As we see from this chart, which uh, you know the shows that you know compared to the global average, you know uh, what is the uh, the China and Indian stand for uh, in terms of their you know economic growth. You see it, uh, on the left hand side, the China has w you know its you know manufacturing is way above its uh, global average, and Indian actually its you know the, its industry actually was below the uh, the, the global average. And uh, when we just look at the services, you know, uh, the uh, the the share of the Chinese services in the economic uh, economic growth is actually is way below, you know, the global average, and Indian was actually a, a little bit above. So this kind of like a, give us a, quite a difference, you know, on uh, uh, the patterns of the economic growth, and uh, also this actually also reflects to their, you know, the uh, the distribution of their foreign direct investment in both countries, as we see. Uh, in the last 10 years, just look at it from 2000 to 2010, and uh, the manufacturing uh, FDI accounts for about 60% of the, uh, chi uh, the, uh, the FDI uh, flows in China, uh, while uh, in Indian is only about like 30%. Uh, and uh, the services is actually, uh, you know, a, a China was only about like uh, less than 40%, Indian was over uh, almost 70%. So again, it's this kind of trend was very, uh, is consistent with the you know the whole economic you know uh, structure. So now the puzzle is you know, as we know that both countries has uh, share a lots of similarities. So they are both have a lots of abundant uh, is a labor abundance and uh, uh, as a developing country is a capital scarce and uh, they also will land scarce economies. So the trade theory would tell us you know if we increasing this in openness to trade would shift their economic patterns towards specializing in labor intensive manufacturing production. So this is kind of like, you know, uh, if we look at this prediction based on the trade theory. But now the, the reality is, you know, uh, China was basically having been specializing this labor intensive manufacturing, while India was go to the, you know, is more focused on the services. Now, the, the puzzle is, why did India and China to similarly endow high growth economies? They have a very different, you know, patterns of the foreign direct investment and economic growth. Now, my explanation is actually going to look at from an institutional perspective. So, what we're going to just, uh, t you know, try to explain is to they do have a different political institutions. You know, people were often time just to look at one is democracy, one's authoritarian regimes. But how did that will be, you know, affect their, you know, fi uh, you know, economic, the patterns of the foreign direct investment and the development path. I look at, you know, how this, you know, the uh, focus on the micro institutions, which is a, a, a specifically on the labor and the land institutions, which I think is they affect as labor mobility, which then 
influence this comparative advantage, then eventually actually that has the impact on the, uh, the, the patterns of foreign direct investment and the development paths. Okay, here's my argument. So my argument is basically have two parts. The first is, you know, uh, uh, the, the key point is the labor mobility affects this FDA patterns. Uh, as I will show you that China has a uh, much higher labor mobility, both the uh, occupational mobility and the spatial ability, which facilitates, uh, which actually increase, strengthen the China's you know, comparative advantage in the uh, labor intensive manufacturing, which actually also facilitates the foreign firms to focus on those you know, labor intensive manufacturing. And Indians, you know, labor mobility is much lower, which actually undermines you know, compar uh, you know, comparative advantage in the labor uh, intensive manufacturing. So that actually facilitates you know, uh, the horizontal of uh, FDA, which actually focus in the services sector. And the second part of this argument is the labor mobility is actually shaped by their domestic institutions. Um, specifically, I will look at the labor institutions, which affects the occupational labor mobility, and the land institutions, which affects the spatial labor mobility. Okay, first of all, let's just look at you know, the, uh, the, the labor mobility. How do we know, how can we actually compare this labor mobility in China, India? One very simple way just to look at the spatial mobility is to look at the urbanization uh, trajectory. So if you just look at the, in, you know, the, uh, the over time from, in 1978 when China started its economic reforms, uh, China's urban population is only about like 19% it's uh, you know the total population while well, Indian was about 22 Indian was, was higher so but after 30 years so India's urban population was only about you know increased to you know 30% and China's over you know uh, uh, 50% so this actually was give us a very simple you know way to look at this you know uh, uh, spatial li labor mobility another uh, more detail, more tec uh, technical, you know, uh, way to look at is to compare, you know, the manufacturing employment in both countries, you know, as we see, you know, in India, you know, there's a, um, uh, you know, formal and informal, uh, you know, uh, workers in the, uh, both in India and China, there's a, you know, a bunch of the formal and informal, you know, uh, manufacturing workers. And uh, the Indians, uh, the, the ratio of the in, informal workers in India was actually has been consistently high, as high as you know uh, 87 percent in 2010. And China, which shows this, you know, the the manufacturing you know, labor market is quite fragmented. So and uh, there is a very l low, you know, flows between the uh, you know the formal and uh, informal you know uh, working uh, workers. Well, in the case of China, so uh, initially China has a most of these workers were, you know, the, the formal workers, and uh, and gradually you see, you know, the informal ratio has increased to about a third of the, you know, total manufacturing workers. This actually shows that the Chinese manufacturing, you know, uh, labor force is both integrated and also they have been a lot of, you know, uh, uh, mobility between those formal and informal, you know, uh, sectors. Okay, now. About another aspect of the labor mobility, which is the you know in which is the you know occupational instability uh, mobility. Here I shows that you know uh, using this uh, uh, the test you know using the wage difference between the different industries to show that you know uh, whether the workers will be likely to move from low wage you know uh, industries to high wage industries if. It's you know if the gap between the different industries is low, which means you know their li labor mobility is quite high. If the gap bet uh, bet uh, between industries is high, which means you know the labor would be less likely to move. So you see, you know the, the gap in chi in China has been consistently much lower than in India, which indicates that you know the uh, the, the occupational labor mobility is much you know uh, higher in China than in India. So. Now, how can we explain those kind of like, you know, different uh, mobility, labor mobility in China, India? I think there are two, I focus on two uh, specific institutions. One is labor institutions, which I argue that they affect the um, occupational uh, labor mobility, because we know that China's, you know, the uh, labor regulations has been considered as a very capital friendly, 
uh, and Indian is more uh, employee friendly, uh, you know, labor regulations. This actually transform into, you know, uh, the consequence of that uh, very f capital friendly uh, labor uh, regulations is they have a weak protection on the labor rights and uh, labor uh, workers are less likely to launch those, you know, collective action or bargain, you know. So the, their job security is low. So that's actually the consequence of this, you know, type of the labor regulations, which creates this high inter-industry labor mobility. And in the case of India, they have, you know, relatively speaking, uh, better protections of uh, work, uh, former workers. And also, you know, the uh, workers have been more likely to uh, organize the trade unions, which uh, they can launch those, you know, large-scale, you know, protest, uh, you know, um, or demonstration. That's, you know, giving more, you know, guarantees or securities for those, you know, former workers, you know, because of those, you know, the uh, the uh, the higher job security that actually leads to the low occupational labor mobility. Okay. I'll be able to finish that. So then the, the second part about, you know, about, what about this, you know, spatial mobility uh, between, especially between the urban and uh, between the rural and uh, uh, urban areas? So I would argue that has to do with the land policy. So I'm, you know, this afternoon there's going to be a, a panel that talking about the land institutions in both countries also. But here I'm going to just touch a little bit on this land institutions. So in China, the land you know, acquisition power is it's monopolized by the government. So the government basically has uh, you know, quite a discretionary authority to decide you know, what type of the, you know, uh, uh, how much land they want to acquire and what's the compensation for, you know, uh, for the, you know, the, uh, the displaced, uh, you know, the, uh, the farmers. So, so that results a large scale land conversion uh, which actually uh, very simple and less costly. And uh, because of those displaced farmers, uh, they received a low compensation from their land, they are more likely to move to the city, which actually, ironically, they actually contributed to a large you know, labor force for the, you know, the manufacturing jobs. And in India, you know, uh, they have this legally bonding power of the compulsory land acquisition. But you know, I argue that actually has the most uh, you know, constraints on their land acquisition, but my colleagues, you know, Prakash may disagree. He still thinks it's not enough. So this actually, you know, and also relatively high compensation for displacement and uh, rehabilitation. And uh, so the result is in India, this large scale land conversation is costly and politically controversial, which, you know, uh, it doesn't, you know, I have some data to show that, you know, uh, land acquisition in China is way, um, large in than in India, which this actually uh, give you know the uh, the Indian uh, farmers less you know opportunity uh, cost to move to the you know urban er areas to seeking for this you know manufacturing jobs. Okay, so now let's actually just try to quickly wrap up. You know how did I you know how institution affect the development pathways in, in China and India? So my simple, you know, uh, way, well, this is actually, there was a several, you know, causatic, you know, causal chains. In China, it is the weak labor protection and the unions and the weak constraints on land acquisitions leads to the high labor mobility, which strengthens the comparative advantage of the, of the, you know, the Chinese economy. And that leads to the, you know, facilitates those, you know, manufacturing led growth and also, you know, encourage the foreign investors to f focus on, you know, the manufacturing based, you know, uh, investment. And in India, it's the stronger labor protection and the unions and the strong constraints on land acquisitions leads to the low labor mobility, which actually weakens the comparative advantage of the India. Uh, economy and uh, facilitates or uh, you know service ba uh, based you know uh, growth and also you know the foreign investment focused on the you know uh, 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 services. Okay, to conclude, uh, I actually having this kind of like a you know uh, the theory, but eventually we, what I try to argue is the institutions matters, but it's not about you know the simply democracy or you know autocracy. It's actually there's various patterns of economic growth 
reflects the firm's adaptation to the in institutional environments. And China's manufacturing-led growth was partially stemmed from its high labor mobility facilitated by its domestic institutions, while India's service-based growth is partially driven by its low labor mobility constrained by the domestic institutions. So, and the, the last point, I would say that a success, you know, because both countries were actually were, you know, trying to move from those middle income countries to uh, uh, those high, uh, middle high income countries, and there is a, uh, you know, uh, we we call it as a middle income trap. So, in order to get rid of the middle income trap, to jump out of the middle income trap, a successful transition towards the sustained high growth requires the developing countries not only the solid political foundation, but also adaptable you know, domestic institutions to eliminate excessive rigidity in the economic structure. So that's my presentation. Thank you.